This podcast is brought to you by WRFL, Radio Free Lexington. Find us online at wrfl.fm. Catch us on your FM radio while you're in Central Kentucky at 88.1 FM, all the way to the left. Thank you for listening, and please be sure to subscribe. Welcome to From the Woods, Kentucky. I'm Laura Lotka, and I'm here with my co-host, Renee Williams. And today in studio, we have Dan Olson and Claudia Cotton. Dan and Claudia both work at the U.S. Forest Service, Daniel Boone National Forest here in Kentucky. And Dan is the forest supervisor, and Claudia is a forest soil scientist at the Daniel Boone. And it's a pleasure to have you two in studio today. Thank you for having us, Laura. Renee. Great. So so today we're going to talk about the Daniel Boone. um, But before we get into that, tell us how you became interested in forestry. Well, actually became interested in fire, forest forest fire. When I was nine years old, I grew up in a family of all construction, a small construction company. Everybody was a carpenter, a mason, electrician, a plumber, whatever. And when I was nine years old, I was watching a show called Lassie. I won't say what year that was, (laughs) until my age. But at that time, Lassie lived with a um, U.S. Forest Service uh, ranger, and there was fire. And I just saw it, and it was something that struck me as something honorable, and, and it's just something that I just knew immediately, that's what I want to do. Uh, I want to fight fire for the U.S. Forest Service, and uh, one of the people that uh, was able to become what he wanted to become when he grew up. And then as a firefighter throughout my career, I had to learn about almost every aspect of the of the Forest Service because if we weren't fighting fire, we were expected to be doing some kind of work. And so got to know about recreation and, and wildlife and timber management and all of the components of the Forest Service and just amazing how many things we do. So that's how I got into it. Not so much forestry, but became forestry and everything right. else. No, that's great. So I grew up in western Kentucky and we had a stand of woods and still have a stand of woods back in behind our house. And that's where I grew up. I just learned to be comfortable in the woods. We hiked in the woods all the time. I loved how my family could identify the mushrooms, the trees, the the plants. They could identify everything. And I wanted to have that skill. And so eventually after a bit of time, I went into forestry and yeah, I love it. That's where I still feel the most comfortable is in the woods. Mm -hmm. Great. Good. Well, tell us what you both do at the Daniel Boone. I'm the forest supervisor, and that's the administrative head of the forest would okay. be is, is be the best term. I'm the senior official of the, the Daniel Boone National Forest in Kentucky, and each national forest in the country has a forest supervisor in any organization that works under. So, well, you know, a lot of my responsibilities is, is administrative, but my primary one is to be an advocate for the forest, to ensure that we're meeting the expectations of the public mm-hmm. uh, who we serve, to make sure that we're achieving our mission is to, you know, sustain the health, diversity, and productivity of our nation's forests and grasslands to meet the needs of current and future generations. Well, that's a mouthful, right? Yeah. So I like to use our motto, which is caring for the land and serving people, mm-hmm. or paraphrase something our founder, Gifford Pinchot, said, which was, uh, you know, the greatest good for the greatest number over the long haul. And that kind of encompasses it. So mm-hmm. so that's kind of my job, is to provide for the greatest good for the greatest number over, over the long haul as it relates to the Daniel Boone National Forest here in Kentucky. Mm-hmm. Okay. Good. What about you? So as forest soil scientist, I'm responsible for maintaining the productivity of the soils across the forest. Because if you think about it, you're not going to have a forest without healthy soils. So that's the 10,000 foot view. But day to day, I work with the, with the timber shop, with the rec shop, with anybody that is doing anything on the forest, be it putting in a new trail, be it conducting a timber harvest. I ensure that they follow the best management practices that we have out there to protect soil and water. I also work on a lot of restoration projects for lands that have been historically degraded to bring those back, bring those back to native forest where currently there might be a lot of invasive species and poor soils and poor water. Now we'll get started and talk about the Daniel Boone National Forest. Tell us <coughs> where it is and, um, you know, for those of 
people that may not be from Kentucky and may not know where it is, just give us a little bit of How an overview of it. <laughs> yeah. Daniel Boone. Okay, there's got to be something there. <laughs> this is my second time in Kentucky. I was here and worked on the Daniel Boone about 25 years ago for a few years and have the pleasure now of coming back as a force supervisor. And I live in the Lexington area. And it's amazing how many times I talk to people, you know, even in the neighborhood that I live, maybe getting my hair cut, who knows. Right. And uh, they'll say, what do you do? I say, well, I'm the force supervisor for the Daniel Boone National Forest. And they'll say, well, I've never been there. And then inevitably, it would be, I've been on Cave Run Lake, or I've been to Red River Gorge, or I've been to the Natural Arch, or, 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 and I'll say, you know what? Right. You've been on the Daniel Boone National Forest, and you've enjoyed it. And so a lot of people don't really know. So thanks for asking that. Mm-hmm. It's a long, narrow group of area of land escape that goes from the Tennessee border to north of Moorhead, roughly paralleling I-75, roughly. I have along the edge of the uh, Cumberland Escarpment. And then there's another area that's farther kind of grouped, uh, a more circular nature that's over to the east around uh, Manchester area of mm-hmm. Kentucky. That's our Redbird District. And, and we have uh, uh, just a little over 700,000 acres of land, I think 708,000. Mm-hmm. It changes a little bit as we do consolidation of lands and all, but a little over 700,000 acres. So it's a large holding mm-hmm. of land available to the public to use for all sorts of opportunities so i i know it's a national treasure so i hope folks get out and and enjoy it and visit it one of the interesting things is that our forest is named after daniel boone right um but yeah it it originally was not originally when it was created in in the 30s it was the cumberland national forest and so then I guess, I've, I don't know when it was that we switched over to Daniel Boone, but we felt that that was a closer representation of... That was when the, the our Redbird District is a purchase unit that was, the most of the force was created in the 1930s as a part of a Weeks Act. We won't get into the technicalities mm-hmm. of that, but it was, the lands were purchased. And in the 1960s, lands became available and uh, Congress authorized us purchasing lands in that Redbird District over by the Manchester area I was mm-hmm. talking about. Mm-hmm. And at that point, when it became the Daniel Boone National Forest, when that oh, district okay. was created, that purchase unit was created. Mm-hmm. And I believe it was called the Daniel Boone because he was, it was in recognition of this great frontiersman who explored a lot of the area that is now the Daniel Boone National Forest. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So can you describe the landscape for the National Forest there? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. This is one of the things that makes us unique, I think. Um, and a lot of people don't really know this side of the Daniel Boone National Forest. So the Cumberland Plateau was an area of uplift, from hundreds of millions of years ago and basically it's an eroded plateau so creeks over time have the the force of water has worked its way down into the the substrate the geology and so what that has caused or what that's resulted in is a land of basically narrow winding ridges and deep coves beautiful geologic formations like rock houses rock rock bridges a lot of cliff line down through there and i mean it is just gorgeous Mm -hmm. if you look at it from above on a topo map it can resemble like brain tissue because it's just winding and it's 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 not it's a pretty complex landscape Mm -hmm. and that's pretty neat because it allows us to have or it creates a lot of different ecological niches for the high diversity of vegetation species that we have on our forest. There's a lot of layers of sandstone overlaying limestone and vice versa. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's that this forest has that is unique is that because of the cliff line and the type of rock and the overhangs, the smaller and larger rock shelter, but around the Red River Gorge and other areas of forest where we have this cliff line, as I understand it, that's it's just outstanding opportunity for rock climbing. International visitors come in to Kentucky, to you know the Red River Gorge and other areas of the forest, specifically for rock climbing. It's one of the many uses we have, but it's also something that's not completely unique to us, but somewhat unique, especially in eastern forests. It's not that common. Mm-hmm. So. I've heard the Daniel Boone be referred to as Arches National Park and a deciduous forest because we have got hundreds of arches across the forest in different geologic formations. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons why we have that, so again, millions of years ago, this was an ancient delta and there were layers of sediment coming off of the ancient Appalachian Mountains into this area and it was and it formed like layers on a layer cake. 
And the topmost layer, a lot of times, is this very resistant sandstone. And the stuff underneath it, it's easier weathered. Mm -hmm. So it erodes a lot faster. Mm -hmm. So over time, as those creeks work their way down into that plateau, it weathered out that shale that was underneath that resistant sandstone. And that's what's made all the arches that we have up and down the forest. We've got a historical geologic snapshot all up and down our forest, and it's really neat. That's good. And with that, can you talk a little bit about maybe the trails or things that you have in terms of recreation so people can get out there and maybe visit those areas and see those things? Now's a good time to do that. Yeah. Oh, yes, absolutely. Well, I'll talk generally about it rather than numbers of campsites because the National Forest is somewhat unique because you can camp, pitch a tent, almost anywhere you want to on the National Forest. It's, oh. it's undesignated camping across much of the forest. And mm-hmm. there's different rules and regulations around that. Like sometimes, whereas recently this fall, we had a, a restriction on campfires. You couldn't have a campfire outside of a designated campsite because of the fire danger that we were in. But other than that, you can camp just about anywhere on the National Forest as long as you're not creating damage to the natural resources, you're not in a wetland, those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Um, and you you can find out about that on our websites so you're wondering about that um, so that's somewhat unique that's not that common right you need to make sure you're on national forest so and not on somebody's backyard right because <laughs> they don't like that <laughs> but we do have everything from that which is basically primitive camping all the way up to very organized campsites where you pay a fee to bring in your rv and enjoy like a long Cave Run Lake or Lower River Lake, marinas on on those lakes as well, and everything in between. Miles and miles of hiking. The shelter we trace goes from, from, actually it starts down in Tennessee a little bit and goes through the entire forest, and it's almost to Ohio now. And so look up the Mm -hmm. shelter we trace. That's Mm -hmm. awesome. Just miles and miles. We have motorized vehicle. Uh, You know, there's forest roads that Mm -hmm. um, we ask that people are respectful and and take care of them and recreate responsibly. Mm -hmm. But just miles and miles and miles of forest service roads that you can enjoy the view on for light activity. There's uh, the climbing, the rock climbing Mm -hmm. that we talked about. There's hunting, fishing. Mm -hmm. There's just about everything that you can imagine available to you is available on the Daniel Boone National Forest, mm-hmm. on all national forests, and certainly wilderness experience. We have two wilderness areas on the forest, which in a wilderness area, most of the national forest is managed for multiple uses. Uh, commercial timber sales, I'd like to come back to that, actually mm-hmm. talk a little bit about that later. But commercial timber sales or, or other kinds of uses of the lands, the wilderness areas are somewhat similar to national parks in that In fact, most national parks or many national parks are wilderness areas. And those are areas that we basically leave untrammeled, untouched. We have some fairly significant rules around no, you know, you can't use anything motorized. Mm -hmm. Even if we're firefighting in there, you use hand saws and things like that to respect the wilderness values. But we have that. So everything from wilderness to RVs with hookups and enjoy and everything in between. I know that there's opportunity on the forest. Some of those are fee. Some of them, you know, there's a there's a limited fee for. Some are no fee at all. And you can get passes uh, for the different areas, like the Red River Gorge has a pass. Uh, Boat ramps have passes that you buy. You can get them at, at the Forest Service offices, our district offices or our supervisor's office, or there's lots of vendors, typically, uh, you know, like a mini mart or a gas station close to National Forest has those passes available for sale as well. So So how do you keep up with the vast amount of people that are within this forest? I mean, if something happens, for instance. Law enforcement? Mm -hmm. (laughs) We have, it depends on what type of response you're talking about. I mean, say if someone gets hurt. Okay. Typically, it's counties and city and and local government has responsibility for emergency response like that, Mm -hmm. like uh, if somebody gets hurt or lost, search and rescue. Mm -hmm. We certainly assist with that. We help wherever we can, but but I'd like to make sure that it's the counties, it's the local Mm -hmm. towns and counties that get the credit for that hard work because that's who does it, Mm -hmm. even on National Forest. Now, oftentimes, so how do we even know, right? Right, exactly. Because we don't know, right? right? We don't know somebody's out there camping on their own. They didn't They didn't have to ask for permission. That's what I was getting at. Right? Yeah. They're just out there. They're hiking. Hey, let's pitch a tent. And there they are. Mm-hmm. So you're out there. Have some means of communication. Mm-hmm. And don't 
account on your cell phone having cell service when you're out in the middle of nowhere on the forest because you may not. Mm -hmm. You know, in the eastern part of the United States, we got pretty good cell service, but even still, I can tell you many areas of the Daniel Boone National Forest where you don't. And so don't count on, don't count on your cell phone or your GPS unit exclusively. Have them with you. They help. They help us. They help us find pathways and trails that we may not otherwise find, but don't rely on it. Have a good old-fashioned map available. Have a compass available. And most importantly, let people know where you're going and when to expect you back. If you don't show up back when you're supposed to, that's when folks will get a hold of us, maybe our law enforcement division, our law enforcement officers, or local search and rescue, etc. Very heavily dependent upon the individual taking personal responsibility, because mm-hmm. otherwise, frankly, you could be there a long time right. before somebody finds you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just want to reiterate the most important piece of what you just said is letting people know where you go and when to expect them back because that's that's primarily how most people get notified. And they'll notify our law enforcement and our law enforcement works very closely with the county search and rescue units. They organize a, a rescue. You've been listening to From the Woods, Kentucky with co-hosts Renee and Laura. We'll be right back after this short break. This is the time when normally you'd be listening to Wildlife Sounds of the Forest with Dr. Matt Springer. But this week, we're giving Matt a break and myself, Jonathan Larson, and Hannah Hollowell will be coming to you with insect sounds from the forest. There are lots of different animals out there and yes, they make interesting sounds, but did you know there are over one million different insect species in the world? And that's only the species that we know about. So for these episodes, you'll be learning a little bit about the amazing insect diversity around us. What are those insects that make those weird sounds? What are they doing and how do they make those noises? We're going to listen to the sound of one insect today. See if you can guess what it is. Stay tuned for the end of the show when we'll talk more about this insect, what it is, and why it's making this noise. Welcome back to From the Woods, Kentucky. Let's get back to our interview. So how many counties does the Daniel Boone span? Totally had to ask that. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> I believe it's 21. Oh, yeah. Wow. And one thing to keep in mind that a lot of folks don't know, right? If you got national forest land, it's not like we all, look, a lot of us own property, right? Mm-hmm. Own release, but and that our house is on, let's say. And we pay property taxes each year. Well, national forests don't pay property tax. And so there are some counties that have a large portion of national forest land they aren't collecting property tax on, mm-hmm. but there are some some accounts that get uh, payment in lieu of taxes. This is one of the ways that the federal government helps to offset that a little bit. That's administered through the Department of Interior. So there's National Force gets some of that, you know, gets some some funding through that to help with county government, help with mm-hmm. services like search and rescue, etc. Mm-hmm. And then when we do commercial timber sales. A portion of the receipts that we get for commercial timber sales goes back to the counties where that where those funds have been earned to again to help offset a little bit that of getting property taxes right. and in addition to that when we do things like have commercial timber sales and understand we don't just have commercial timber sales and cut trees just for the sake of having commercial timber sales we right. do so because it's important to have all age distributions you don't want one age forest because eventually if everything's the same age, eventually everything gets old and, and can become not in the shape we want it to be. And right. so we want a mixture. Wildlife needs younger uh, browse, for example, mm-hmm. to feed on some kinds of wildlife. Some right. need to more mature, etc. Like a myriad of reasons why we do this. 
But one is also we have a responsibility to the American public and to local communities to help their economy. Mm -hmm. And when we have commercial timber sales, there's local loggers that, that are employing folks. Uh, maybe that goes to a local mill. Hopefully it goes to a local mill to be created into a, uh, some other product, be it lumber for our houses, right? Mm -hmm. Carbon sequestration is something that a lot of people hear about nowadays, right? Well, one of the best ways to sequester carbon is for it to be in a board that is constructing a house because that carbon is sequestered as long as that house is there, for example. Mm -hmm. so, so that's just one of the benefits, but it's one of, it is a very specific reason for our existence, we're a multi-use agency, and it's almost like recreation where it's kind of soup to nuts. Mm -hmm. What we do with and on the National Forest is as well. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to make a pitch that your listeners, our listeners, mm -hmm. can make a difference on that. Mm -hmm. We have a responsibility through our Environmental Policy Act, NEPA. Our short term, we just say NEPA and mm -hmm. as though it's a verb, and it's right. not a verb, <laughs> but, but it's a process we go through before we do any project to make sure that we have collaboration, input from our public, and that public's all over the, the nation. Mm -hmm. But, frankly, we're in Kentucky. Kentucky hosts the Daniel Boone National Forest. We're a part of the woodlands of eastern Kentucky, which are vast and much more than just the National Forest, but we're a part of it. And we want the folks in Kentucky to be a part of helping us decide what we do. And so mm -hmm. folks can get involved. You'll see ads in the paper, like the Lexington Herald or the local papers, when we're approaching a decision or, or a request to come to a public meeting where we can talk about what are the things that we're considering, or more importantly, what are the things we ought to be considering that we aren't considering? What, mm -hmm. do you, what, does, the, what does the American people and the citizens of Kentucky want us to do? Please get involved. We want to hear from you. It's not us against them. It's us together. We have a responsibility to consider everybody's um, input, and we, in fact, do so, mm -hmm. and we want to hear it. So I, I hope that the folks that are listening today will, will take the opportunity to get engaged to help us do a better job of caring for the land and serving them because it's their land and they're the people, right? Mm -hmm. right. So. And, and what's the best way for them to do that? I mean, do you have um, places that we can put a link, uh, you know, to your website or, you know, just what, how can they find out about upcoming activities or places for that public input? So if you get onto our website, if you Google U.S. Forest Service Daniel Boone National Forest, on that homepage, over on the left-hand side, there's a tab that says planning. If you hit that tab, you can go into there and there is a, um, a schedule of proposed actions. And you can hit that link and it will give you all the information on every single project that we've got going on at that time and what documents have been made or available on it, which should be everything that has to do with it, if any decisions have been made, and how you can get involved with it, how you can respond, and how you can communicate with us about your concerns or your any feelings that you have about those projects. Mm -hmm. And we would ask that folks object if it's something they object to. And that's mm -hmm. a, there's a specific legal term around that. What I'm talking about is if it just don't like something, then say right. so. Yeah. Uh, but also, if it do like something, we'd sure like to hear that as well, because that helps point us in the in the right direction. So mm -hmm. That's what, whenever we get comments back. Comments, any, thank you. Yes, mm -hmm. anytime we, we propose a project, we have to put it out to the public. Anytime that soil is disturbed, essentially, mm -hmm. we have to put out a description of that project to the public and we invite their comments back and so something that's very useful to us instead of just writing us a comment saying I don't like this or I like it tell us what you don't like about it be very specific and also tell us how you think we should do it give us feedback help us manage mm -hmm. that's what we're looking for we're not looking for opinion we're looking for facts and we're looking for solid things we can take to the bank to put on the ground and get this job done. Mm -hmm. I would also say that if we don't have a computer, right, mm -hmm. not everybody does, not comfortable wading through websites and trying to find things, call us. Call our mm -hmm. office. Ask for the district ranger, right, or ask yes. for the forest mm -hmm. supervisor. And uh, and we'd love to hear from the public. And, and if it's a comment or a concern, we'll capture it, even if we need to capture it just directly by writing it down, we will. And at a minimum, we can help navigate through 
the process because it, it can be somewhat bureaucratic at times, mm-hmm. you know, uh, even for us. Mm-hmm. So uh, so certainly, though, certainly pick up the phone and call us, if nothing else, or stop in. Okay. Uh, we, do, we like that even better. So you've talked a little bit about recreation. You've talked about some of the timber sales. Can you tell us a little bit about um, some of the research activities that you do on the forest as well? Absolutely. So just to be clear, the, on the National Forest, our primary goal is management. Mm-hmm. But we do work a lot with researchers and provide research opportunities. And it's it's nice because as adjunct faculty here at UK, I can still be involved with Chris Barton, with Mary Arthur, with various research mm-hmm. projects and we to open the forest up to research. For some examples that we have are mm-hmm. Dr. Mary Arthur here at UK. She's conducted decades of prescribed and wildland fire research on our forest with respect to oak regeneration, with respect to fire return intervals, and we still work hand in hand with Mary on certain areas and trying to figure out the effects Mm -hmm. of both types of fire on the landscape of the Daniel Boone. Some of the most longest running continuous research in this uh, forest type in the whole country. Oh, that's so great. it's yeah. really, a, really a huge value to us. Mm-hmm. So we work with Eastern Kentucky University also on wetland research up on our Cumberland district, and they're doing a lot of really good work on characterizing wetland features. Chris Barton is another professor here at UK that we collaborate quite mm-hmm. a bit with, and we have a lot of strip mined areas across the forest that have denuded soils. They're invasive nurseries, for lack of a better term, because they just haven't been brought back to our native forest and our native mm-hmm. soil productivity. Mm-hmm. So we work closely with Chris and Green Forest Work to to rip these lands to alleviate the compaction and then to plant native species to return the native forest where they once were. Mm-hmm. So that provides all kinds of benefits. There are a couple of areas that are some of the things that's it's almost like if you said it, did you know? Did you know mm-hmm. this is going on or not? You don't think about it. I don't right. think about it yeah. as being a national forest and, and the mine land reclamation. Now that's now owned under the national forest system that we're helping, but we're more and more getting into uh, shared stewardship to partnering with all the other state and federal agencies to to look more and more across our boundary. Problems don't stop at the boundary, no, right? They don't. Uh, uh, and mine land rec- reclamation, uh, the water runoff from mines, and and work that we've got, you know, that we're partnering on on that. And one of the ones that's really so um, really refreshing to me. There's a couple of areas we've done but and it's terribly expensive and we rely upon grants and assistance and partnering and all to do but when this land and boy I get outside of my expertise but that's what I'm in general <laughs> but when this land was settled a lot of the bottom land is where we wanted to put farming right mm-hmm. do farming and and a lot of those had meandering streams through it what's a lot more efficient especially once things became mechanized to have it straight and square fields and so a lot of the streams that once meandered through these bottomlands you know were channeled and straight and they're over to one side of the valley and if and if you drive around you'll see that if we may not have realized it but you'll see it and Mm -hmm. and it's straight and that's just not natural Mm -hmm. and you go there and it's scoured down to bare rock there's really not a whole lot of life in those streams Uh, Mm -hmm. there's not a lot of ability to filter filter the water to help the water quality a couple of areas on the forest now that we've been able to go in for fairly significant mile plus areas and rechannelize that and get them meandering get hmm. meander the streams again plant some native vegetation but what's most remarkable is how quickly the system recovers on its own you go there a year later and you look and you see where the boundary of the forest is where this work has started it's almost like looking into a wilderness or a meadow out west because mm-hmm. meandering stream with native vegetation with fish in the stream with plant life in the stream that helps filter the water and and so it all connects together but you think it's really cool that this is happening on your national forest on the Danny Boone National Forest. It's almost like the streams are going oh we're home. Well exactly (laughs) exactly exactly and that's the feeling you get Mm -hmm. or I get at Mm -hmm. least when when we see that. Mm -hmm. Dan was talking about our stream restoration work that we have across the forest and one of our partners that we work with on those restorations is the University of Louisville Stream Institute. It's headed out by Dr. Art Parola, Mm -hmm. and he has been instrumental in helping us see what Dan was describing, the impairment of the streams Mm -hmm. and what you get whenever you restore those. Mm -hmm. And something that's pretty neat about those stream restorations is that 
over time, a lot of, we call it post-settlement alluvium. So after the areas were settled, they would clear the hillsides and whatever they could for farming use. And those areas eroded. And especially mm-hmm. after the, the forest got cut. And, but you know, between the late 1800s and early 1900s, a lot of sediment came in, down into our waterways. Mm-hmm. So whenever UofL goes in and they restore a stream, they remove a lot of that post-settlement alluvium. Then they'll put the stream in and put the structures in. And But what has been amazing is the fact that things that we didn't plant and that haven't been seen in those ecosystems for decades, such as rushes and sedges and cattail, I mean, they all come back. Mm. And so the ecosystem has a memory Mm -hmm. and we are able to revive that memory of it. And it's Mm. just really exciting to see Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. true restoration to something that was there before. And I would build on that, that there's uh, some of those are, could be rare and endangered plant species Mm -hmm. that maybe don't even, didn't even know were there. And so we Mm -hmm. partner very closely with the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves and their the work that they do uh, on behalf of the Fish and Wildlife Service, but uh, and state of Kentucky obviously on tracking, supporting, and collecting information about those species. And and uh, last week I was out in Oklahoma meeting with the uh, tribes. There's six tribes uh, that historically consider Kentucky as part of their ancient hunting lands three Cherokee and three Shawnee tribes, and I was meeting with them about lots of things about our partnering together, Mm -hmm. because we need to consider their input as well as uh, sovereign nations. But specifically, one of the things we talked about was um, native cane, river cane, Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something the tribes have used, you know, many, many tribes use, and they're very interested in working together with us to, to look at ways that maybe we can restore river cane as well, and Mm -hmm. then specifically some of the cultivars that they would consider to be, you know, for example, Cherokee cultivars or, mm-hmm. or otherwise. So the Living Archaeology Weekend is about teaching the importance and the sensitivity of those resources and, and of, of those artifacts, for example. You know, they to us, they might be artifacts, right? Like mm-hmm. they, you find an arrowhead or something like that. Um, well, to the, to the tribes, it's not. It's their heritage. It's their history. It's mm-hmm. it's in many, in some cases, their, their graves, right? And so mm-hmm. we are, need to be very sensitive of it. And we obviously, obviously would ask our visitors to also be very sensitive about understand, look, see, enjoy, but don't take. Um, and, you know, because you some things are renewable resources, but the heritage resources are not renewable. If mm-hmm. they get damaged, stolen, removed, they're, they're gone forever. So living archaeology is about telling that story. It's about showing how things were done, how arrowheads were made, how mm-hmm. spears were done, how shelters, you know, uh, uh, primitive shelters were done, and teaching, helping to teach fifth graders from around Eastern, all around Eastern Kentucky, including, I know, uh, Versailles, Lexington School, mm-hmm. from all around, and then certainly the local county schools come in. And then on a Saturday, it's open to the general public. And mm-hmm. And I think we get around a thousand folks wow. uh, a, a day at those, yeah. and that's just one. Locally at the districts, there are all kinds of activities going on. Mm-hmm. There's a storytelling, you know, and a lot of times it's with partners. It's not us doing it; it's organizations doing it. The mm-hmm. storytellers is not a forest service event; it's a storyteller event mm-hmm. up on Cave Run Lake. But it's huge; it's a mm-hmm. big deal. Where else are you going to find better storytellers than in Eastern Kentucky, right? Mm-hmm. The other things yeah. to do locally is check check with your local district rangers or the district offices. We have four: one in right along Cave Run Lake near the dam, close to the dam on Cave Run Lake. Mm -hmm. our Cumberland District Office. We have a district office in London off of Highway 25. Have a district office in um, down in Whitley City. Um, it's our Stearns district, and we have a district office. It's our Redbird uh, district office. It's out um, somewhat close to the Redbird Mission in that general area. It's hard to describe. There's not a lot of landmarks there to tell folks, but uh, but heading about 20 miles east of uh, Manchester mm-hmm. uh, along the Parkway, the Hal Rogers Parkway. You'll see a sign for the fourth. Those district offices they hold a lot of local events whether they're forest service or not fishing derbies is something that's really oh, popular yeah. each district every year will host a fishing derby where uh working with the state will bring in bring in oftentimes it's to bring in trout or or other fish to a pond or to a local stream or whatever mm-hmm. and then it's designed for the kids to get connected mm-hmm. and learn maybe it's, in many cases it's the first fish 
a lot of the kids have ever caught, for right. example. And so, of course, we have a lot of events with Smokey Bear and, and our partnership, uh, Forestress partnership with the National Association of State Foresters. And so here in Kentucky, it'd be Kentucky Division of Forestry, and we partner on fire prevention efforts. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, fire is a big part of what the Forest Service is about in, in Kentucky and also uh, across the country. And a lot of folks think of that as just fire suppression, you know, mm-hmm. putting out fires. Mm-hmm. And that is a big part of it. There's no question about it. But it's also about managing fires. You've been listening to From the Woods, Kentucky with co hosts Renee and Laura. We'll be right back after this short break. Welcome back to From the Woods, Kentucky. Let's get back to our interview. Most of the natural landscapes in the country had fire in them throughout history in some way, shape, or form. The plant species, uh, there's many plant species, even in Kentucky here, that require some amount of fire in order to reproduce. Maybe it's to to burn away some of the litter, leaf litter and Mm -hmm. things like that, so that seeds can find purchase in the soil. Or there are pine species that need a really hot fire in order to melt the resin on the pine cone so that they'll open up mm. and cast their cast their seed. Those species are designed to have hot fire and completely open environment for their seed to survive, for yeah. example, and everything in between. And part of what we do in the Forest Service also is we call it prescribed burning. And it's, it's a prescription for the landscape that um, like a doctor would prescribe something to help us get healthier on, for some way, shape or form. Well, you know, we would we prescribe to intentionally put fire on a landscape at certain times, certain intervals, uh, certain intensities, and we try to be pretty precise in that. It's as much an art as a science. It's both. It's a blending of both. Um, but we partner very much with uh, the Nature Conservancy, TNC. It has what's called a fire learning network. They host the Fire Learning Network system. But the Fire Learning Network is about partnerships with many, many entities, with colleges and universities, with federal and state agencies, with uh, nonprofit groups like the Turkey Feder- National Turkey Federation or Grouse Federation or uh, uh, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, etc. In partnership, the idea is, is to have the landscape doing the right things, being able to support the wildlife or the plant species or or the water quality that we're that we strive for and that's a big part of what the fire learning network does in terms of utilizing fire and science to to help us in, as we um, I would say are the artists in applying it on mm-hmm. the ground so so that's another thing that that we do in a partnership effort and so there's a and this is probably one of them things that people would have to Google because I'm I, I'm starting to say this without being prepared to. Yeah. But there's a um, uh, like a podcast, a vehicle tour mm-hmm. uh, down in the southern part of our, our, our London and Stearns district where we do a lot of prescribed burning, and it'll have stops along the way and then describe to you, you know, this is what the fire treatment was and why it was and and all that. So a, a driving lot, a tour kind of yeah. thing with your mm-hmm. own tour guide and yeah. your radio, I yeah. guess. <laughs> and then on the shelter retrace again, it's not a forest service sponsored. That's the neat thing. It doesn't need to be us. It's, you know, the forest is for everybody. And the Shelter We Trace Association, which they do so much work. On, it's a it's a not-for-profit organization that partners with us, and they do so much work along that whole trail. In fact, got a Regional Foresters Award last year, I believe it was, uh, for all of the work they do. Well-deserved. Mm-hmm. Uh, tremendous amount of volunteer work to keep the trail, uh, uh, you know, nice and and manageable, but they sponsor a hike the trail event to where you can do it all at once, right? If you're really you're really gung ho, you can go through, or you can do it in stages over over multiple weekends or multiple days, and mm-hmm. and so you know check that out too. Those are the kind of things. It's a uh, horse riding events on the a, a hundred mile race foot race down in our in the Stearns district. Uh, you know cross country mm-hmm. foot races that that again it's not it's not foresters, but it's on the national forest. So many, many ways to enjoy it. How many miles of trails do you have? I believe it's just over 600. Could you take a trail from one end to the other if you wanted to? It literally, the shelter, you we, could do that. It, the shelter we trace is the one that, that, that specific trail, but there are all sorts of offshoots mm-hmm. to the trails. I would say on trails, um, there, we have official Forest Service trails and they'll be right. mapped in our system and all. One of the areas that, that uh, of concern for us is that uh, a lot of times we call them user developed trails and uh, mm. they decide, well, what if I wander over? Over here I wonder what I'd see and then other people do and before you know it there's it looks like there's a trail there but right. it's not signed 
It's not mapped. Mm -hmm. um, if somebody gets lost on that, we may not be able to find because we don't know where you are. And most importantly, it hasn't been uh, created or managed to be sensitive to the natural resources, to the mm -hmm. soils. To, you know, it, it could be going straight down the side of a slope. And when the next time there's a rainfall comes, it washes the soil off of the hillside, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of times people don't understand that they don't intend. A lot of folk don't intend to do any damage whatsoever. Just want to see something, right? Mm -hmm. And so just, you know, I would ask, just think about it. Think about what might this do. And if you wonder, you know, ask your Forest Service, ask a trails technician. You see somebody in a Forest Service uniform, stop by the district offices and ask. And we have maps for those and, and all. And also, if you want to get involved and to help, we could use the help, right? Volunteerism is something that is a huge part of, of helping. Again, it's helping the forest be better for everybody else. So we would... If, you, if uh, folks are interested in helping and volunteer, in particularly in trails work and recreation is the area where we have the most opportunity for that, mm -hmm. but we have opportunity in and just about anything. If somebody would like to get engaged and to help us on the National Forest, uh, we'd, we'd, we'd love for them to do so. We have 628 miles of trails across mm -hmm. the Daniel Boone National Forest. And the longest one of those is the shelter we trace, and it runs from north of Moorhead all the way down to the Tennessee line. Well, that's a long, long way. Yes. You can, you yes. can definitely walk that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Over several days. <laughs> I, I really want to put a shout out to Dr. Jeff Stringer here in the UK. He's headed up and has been an integral part of an initiative, a White Oak initiative. It's a multi-state, multi-region, multi-forest initiative to address um, white oak and the sustainability of white oak. And for those of us who live in Kentucky, there's a lot of uses and purposes for white oak. But for those of us in Kentucky, one of the things that I think we all can appreciate is bourbon, Kentucky bourbon. And Kentucky bourbon is based upon, in very heavily, not exclusively, but vast majority of the of the wood barrels, the staves in the wood barrels are uh, are white oak because that's the best. That's the the bourbon distillers will tell you that's the best material for those. And the white oak initiative is really looking at how do we make sure that that's a sustainable source of white oak into the future. Uh, you know, the bourbon industry has been very uh, successful and, and is growing and there's more and more need for it. And right now, today, there's enough white oak out there, both on federal, state, and more importantly, on private lands. Um, but what there isn't is a good age distribution. There's not a lot of young white oak out there right now um, uh, for a lot of different reasons. A lot of it gets over out competed by some faster growing species like red maples, etc. Mm -hmm. And and so the White Oak Initiative is about how do we, you know, come to, together in a gr very broad partnership, look at ways to ensure the sustainability of this wonderful natural resource of white oak into the future, so that we are uh, we do have young white oak that in the future will be older white oak that's mm -hmm. available to to keep that industry going. And I and the University of Kentucky, many universities. In colleges agencies are working together but i really thought i'd put a shout out to dr stringer and the university of kentucky because really leading that effort for us if anybody wants Thanks. to know more about that we actually did a, a podcast on that and a show on that um i don't yeah. put a link to that yeah. on the white oak initiative and we so certainly are a big partner in that yeah, well, with, thank you, with thank you for that. thanks for partnering yeah so you both have presented us with a lot of great information and are there any takeaway items that you all would like to leave our listeners with Mainly, get out and enjoy your national forest. Get out to the Daniel Boone. We manage this forest for many uses, but the best use, in my mind, is recreation mm -hmm. and in the public's mind. And so, get out. Get in the creeks. Get on the lakes. Go out and see the beautiful geologic features that we have out there. Because a lot of people don't realize gem that we have right in our backyards. Mm -hmm. And it's literally magical when you get out there and you start seeing the beauty that we have across this landscape. I would uh, I would double down on that a right. bit. That's exactly right. Uh, well, being a firefighter with U.S. Forest Service, I've seen beautiful parts of this country from one end to the other, literally throughout my 37-year career. I tell people, usually it's on fire, but it's still beautiful. <laughs> but I tell you, there's few more beautiful than the Daniel Boone National Forest or eastern Kentucky in general. The the woodlands of eastern Kentucky, the rolling hills, the steeper, the steeper territory, it's beautiful country, and the Daniel Boone is a part of that. 
And uh, so one, get out and enjoy it. Two, get active and, and help us. If no other way, let us know what you think. Let us know what you think. Let us know how we can do a better job of caring for the land, the Dane Boone National Forest, and serving the people, the citizens of Kentucky and of the United States. Great. Well, thank you guys both for joining us today. And if you'd like more information on what you've heard on this segment of today's show, visit our website at www.fromthewoodsky.org. You've been listening to From the Woods, Kentucky with co-hosts Renee and Laura. We'll be right back after this short break. Welcome back to Insect Sounds from the Forest. I'm Dr. Ellen Crocker in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources at the University of Kentucky. Before we tell you what that is, let's listen to that sound once more. And I'm here today with a few entomologists who are going to be guiding us through the world of insect sounds that you might hear in the woods or maybe even around your house. So here with me today is Dr. Jonathan Larson. Hello, hello. He's an entomology extension specialist. That's me. Yeah, <laughs> welcome. And host of his own podcast, That's Arthropod. True. Arthropod, right? yes. <laughs> So the true professional here. <laughs> um, as well as Hannah Hallwell. Hi. And she is a graduate student in the entomology department. So welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Hmm. What do you think that sounded? Definitely is? heard that. <laughs> yeah. Something similar to that before. <laughs> I was talking with someone who was visiting from uh, an urban area, from New York City, earlier this summer. And um, we were walking around. They were trying to record. And they were like, what is that sound? It's everywhere. Where can we go that won't sound like that? <laughs> and I was like, oh, you're not going to go anywhere that it doesn't sound like key in the summertime. <laughs> So that's the sound of our very familiar uh, cicada uh -huh. that we have in this area. And that's a one particular cicada species. You might be surprised to know that there are lots of different cicadas in the trees surrounding us. How many cicadas are there? In the world? <laughs> well, in Kentucky, <laughs> let's put it that way. Uh, globally, I'd say there's like 3,000 species or so. Oh, my cicadas. goodness. Yeah, yeah. They range in size from the biggest one is the empress cicada. And then there's the ones that we have here, the periodical cicadas, which are a little smaller, but come out by the millions. So there's lots of different species vari variations out there. And Hannah, this is one of your favorite cicada sounds, right? Can you tell us a little yeah. bit about the species? So this one that we just heard was Lynn cicada, um, which is one of the annual cicadas. So they come out every year, but they live underground for multiple years before coming out. So they're not just, they don't just have a one year life cycle. So it's pretty neat too, because um, this one in particular, you can hear it like slowly build. Um, so when you first might start to hear this, it's like really soft and it just gets very loud. And if you get a whole group of them together, it can be very deafening. I feel like that's the case with a lot of cicadas, but this one in particular is one of my favorites. So cicadas are fascinating because yeah. we see them, you know, briefly in the summertime, but they're far older than that, right? Mm -hmm. So any cicada that you see, how long has it been alive? How old is it by the time that we see it? Most of the annuals, I think four to five years. And then the periodic cicadas, 13, 17 years. Yeah. Except some of them have a plus or minus on that. You can find stragglers and early risers with periodic <laughs> cicadas that will come out before those, those numbers. So you can get, I think it's up to even four years after the original yeah. big brood emergence, you'll see some periodicals still coming out. So let's talk about that a little bit, because sure. I haven't seen a huge brood emergence right here in Lexington, but in other places I live, in some years, it just feels like everything is <laughs> covered with cicadas, <laughs> and you walk around and are deafened by the sound of these cicadas everywhere, and I've even seen cicada cookbooks mm -hmm. out there. <laughs> oh. I've never had a chance to try it, <laughs> um, but tons and tons of cicadas. Yes, they, they come out in big numbers. Uh, they're supposed to have a nice nutty flavor, is what yeah, I've been told. Yeah. Have you tried one before? No, I <laughs> oh my goodness. I, I've seen them on shish kebabs. I've seen oh, them just nice. cooked over open coals. So you haven't yeah. tried it though? Uh, I didn't. I didn't get to try it. Oh. I was at an event when I lived in Nebraska. We had an emergence in Omaha, and there was be there was a beer they named after it. And <laughs> I, I, can't remember, I don't think it had a cicada flavoring, 
but it just had the logo on it. And then they had a, bu- a cook-off with them. But I had to leave the event after I gave my talk. I didn't get to eat it. Yeah, I got like yeah. 17 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. time, right? So they live underground for a long period of time then? How long? These periodical ones, it's either that 13 or 17 year period. Okay. So they their eggs are laid up in the trees and they fall down as nymphs. They bury themselves down in the soil and they feed on the sap and the different fluids of the tree that they suck out of the roots with a needle-like mouth part and they just bide their time. It's not a very nutritious diet. Imagine if you just got to drink Sprite for like the first 17 years of your life. <laughs> oh my goodness. You would need a lot of it in order to get strong and big and be able to come out. So that's one reason it might take them a long time, but it's also kind of a, a predator overpopulation strategy. Is that mm-hmm. fair to say? Yeah. There's too many of them to eat all of them. And so they all come out in this big mass. <laughs> okay. So let's take a listen to what those cicadas sound like, a little bit different from some of our annual cicadas. Um, and just keep in mind that if you were in listening to this in the real world, it would be deafening. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you don't have your headphones on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. If you do, we should have warned you. <laughs> so what eats the cicadas, or do they just go back underground? What what happens to them? Well, after the periodical cicadas, after they emerge, and uh, you, you can see their little shells all over the trees all the time after they um, emerge as adults. They fly around, they mate, lay eggs, and then they die. But like he was saying, we a lot of them will emerge in these mass numbers so that they there are too many of them for predators to eat. So I think birds... Turkeys love turkeys, them. Turkeys, turkeys. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. And so by emerging in these massive quantities, there's a greater chance that some of them will survive this attack by turkeys and, <laughs> and others. Squirrels, I think, like them, if I remember correctly. Dogs, I've seen them Yes. Eat. They seem like a pretty yeah. tasty snack for anything yes, that could absolutely. find. Well, if they taste like a nut, <laughs> you know, they might be all right. Yeah. And so that sound that you just played, that's the one that happens every 15 to 17 years? Is that... And what you're actually hearing is tons and tons of them, not just one individual, right. but many, many, many different cicadas making that sound all at the same time. And where would they be found in Kentucky? Everywhere or... Uh, cicadas, they like wooded areas. They okay. need long lasting trees in order to be able to have something to eat while they're underground. So they like oaks and some of those other sort of strong, long lasting species. So anywhere that you see a thick wood area like that, that's kind of where I would say. River okay. areas, they also like mm-hmm. wet. And your backyard, as long as you have nice trees. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't hurt the tree for that many to be around it and sucking the sprite out of it. <laughs> right. No, that's not as bad. The problem that we sometimes see with cicadas is when they lay their eggs in the tree, they cause these oviposition scars to appear in the branches. Uh-huh. So they slice. They have a sword on their abdomen that they slice the bark and put their eggs in the tree. So you'll see it looks like somebody went through with a knife and just went down the branch, huh. and the eggs are kind of tucked into there. Now, typically, it's not a problem long term for right. the tree's health, but if you had a ton of them in a really big year, uh, you definitely could could be seeing signs from that damage to branch tips um, for a while to come. In a- urban areas, it's when people plant a tree. Mm-hmm. If they have a new tree that they've just put in, those young ones can sometimes be harmed by the cicadas. Hmm. You work out in the field, you hear a lot of them. What are they doing when they're yelling at each other like this? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's always interesting um, because even out in the field, I've heard them so many times and I think it's taken me a while to realize that there's different sounds that vary slightly between the species. And so, you know, we might be walking through the forest and we hear a bunch of them up in the trees and it's like just deafening. And then we walk a little further and it sounds slightly different, but it's still deafening. Like it, <laughs> n- no matter how far we go. And I think also it depends on um, like the time of day to a certain extent. Uh, just how loud they are. Um, some of them prefer, I guess, dusk, right? Right. Um, and uh, they just, I, they can be very, very loud. <laughs> Do you think it's deafening with romance? I mean, that's oh, the point yeah. of all <laughs> yeah. right? yeah. Just to find love. Yeah. I was like, is that the whole <laughs> point of the noise? Yeah. 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 Okay. And but how do they make the noise? So when you look at a cicada's abdomen, on the side near the wings, there's a timbal muscle. A timbal is usually what you listen with, but they can also flex their timbal <laughs> in order to make it click. Uh-huh. The male is the one that's going to be doing this. So he flexes the timbal muscle and then unflexes it 
and it makes a clicking noise. His abdomen is essentially hollow, so it reverberates inside of him, and it comes out as that loud, I, I don't even know what you would call it, like clicking, gurring, grinding <laughs> like noise. Trilling. Yeah, <laughs> trilling. That's the, that's the scientific. <laughs> yes, and then, so it comes out in this loud noise. They make a noise to try and get everybody together. It's like, hey, let's start a barbershop quartet. <laughs> let's start singing in the trees. That brings females around. And then they're going to make courtship songs when they get next to one another, when they find a special lady that they uh -huh. want to sing to. <laughs> and then there is an acceptance click that the female makes. So she can't make the loud noises that we hear, mm -hmm. but she does make an acceptance noise that initiates the mating. Hmm. Who knew all that was <laughs> in that sound? <laughs> they also have angry noises. that they make. Have you ever grabbed one and gotten the angry grinding yes. noise? Yeah. So if you pick a cicada up, they make this like rah, 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 kind of noise that <laughs> yeah. says, let me go, I don't like this. <laughs> So if the other noise is a trill, is that a quack? Yeah, I, I was going for a Donald Duck kind of thing. <laughs> well, thank you both for coming and talking about cicadas, teaching us something new, and definitely next time you're hearing those romantic sounds in summer, <laughs> keep in mind that it's many different species, and they're all just looking for love. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. If you'd like more information on what you've heard on this segment of today's show, visit our website at www.fromthewoodsky.org. Hey there. If you're enjoying this podcast from WRFL Lexington, you may enjoy our live radio stream at wrfl.fm and, of course, via radio at 88.1 FM in the central Kentucky area. We have a wide variety of programs you're sure to enjoy. Just go to wrfl.fm slash schedule and see what programs appeal most to you. Thanks again for listening to this podcast from WRFL Lexington.